get if you take 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole and divide by the, the Schwarzschild coefficient. So what does it mean? It means that um, an object gets ripped apart when uh, the tidal force across the object is bigger than the self-gravity of the object. That boils down to the density of the object being similar to the density of the other object that is di disrupting it. And so what that means is that if you take a star like the sun and bring it uh, near a black hole, it will get ripped apart as long as the black hole has a mass less than 10 to the 8 solar masses. Because then the characteristic density, mass density of the black hole is far greater. So um, when you get to 10 to the 8 solar masses, the star can be swallowed whole. It gets ripped, ripped apart inside the horizon, but you don't see that. <coughs> so uh, that's an interesting point that, that only about 10 to the 8 uh, solar mass stars are getting swallowed. And that also applies to, um, to planets, for example, uh, like the Earth. Uh, planets have a density similar to that of, of stars. So by the way, if you consider a planet getting close to a star, it will never get ripped apart uh, only when it's at grazing incidence because it has roughly the same density as the star. So this is just a tidbit for you to keep in mind when you hear about the disruptions that the biggest black holes in the universe do not destroy stars, they swallow them. Only the small ones destroy stars. And now for the Yes, so it's a great pleasure to have Sasha Heiko visiting us again at the Vacuum Initiative. Uh, Sasha is a student in Cambridge University in UK, where she works under supervision Malcolm Perry, and uh, she was uh, visiting, uh, visiting us last year for seven months, so I'm ha very happy to have her back here, and she will tell us about new exciting results about black hole entropy. Um, thanks very much, Laura. Uh, it's really great to be back. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing with Andy um, here, and also with Malcolm back in Cambridge and Stephen Hawking while he's still with us. Um, Malcolm <coughs> gave a talk about this at the BHI on the... <coughs> it doesn't happen every time. <laughs> um, so Malcolm spoke about this uh, about six months ago, so I what I want to do is um, recap about that and also give an update on the progress we've made since then. So I want to basically address the question of whether soft hair can account for the entropy of a black hole. I thought I'd start by just recapping why we think that black holes have an entropy in the first place. And the um, no-hair theorems tell us that um, all black hole stationary spacetimes are unique and characterized by three um, quantities, the mass, um, m, the charge q, and the angular momentum <coughs> j of the black hole. And problem is that we can classically we can form a black hole with these three parameters in an infinite number of ways, which suggests that black holes have in, infinite entropy, and that suggests their temperature is zero. And this was sort of um, the status of things until Hawking discovered Hawking radiation and Hawking temperature of black holes. So um, the first law of black hole mechanics says that an infinitesimal change in black hole equilibrium states is described by this formula. And if you change um, the mass, the charge, and the angular momentum, you have a corresponding change in the area um, of the black hole. <coughs> and this um, has a great resemblance with the first law of thermodynamics. Um, the second law of black hole mechanics says that for any change in the equilibrium state of the black hole, subject to the weak energy conditioning of matter, the area of the event horizon increases. And this resembles the second law of thermodynamics their entropy increases. And if you compare these two sets of laws, you can um, come to the conclusion that actually black holes have a finite entropy and temperature. Um, the temperature is given by the ordinary temperature, and the entropy is governed by the famous Stephen Stephen Hawking entropy law, um, that's related to the area S is A over 4. Um, but the problem with this is that we understand um, entropy <coughs> in terms of the density of states. The Boltzmann interpretation of entropy is in terms of these density of states. <coughs> and we want to um, ask the question, what are the quantum states of a black hole? 
the way we did this was we um, used the covariant phase space organism, and we start with the action, um, the gravitational action, and then we vary this action. Um, we take the metric goes from g to g plus h, or h is some perturbation, and this gives us normal equations of motion and a boundary term. And if this was a, a normal grant, and you could think of the variation, the boundary term is they have to solve um, the generalized coordinates and momentum. But this boundary term gives us the um, something we call the presynthetic potential, and this is an explicit formula in terms of the perturbation. And we can now use that presynthetic potential to derive um, the synthetic form, which is really um, the fundamental like object that we'll be using. So the way you get the um, presynthetic form is you take a second variation, h prime of the metric, and you then um, the presynthetic form omega, which is a function of the metric um, g h and h prime, is the variation of the <coughs> presynthetic potential. So like delta h prime theta. And the integral of this presynthetic form over a space like surface sigma will give rise to the symplectic form, which is the object we'll really be using. And if um, h and h prime satisfy the linearized Einstein equation, then we find that um, omega, little omega, is divergence free, and we can um, make use of that. So the, the phase basis theory is, is given by these um, solutions to the um, Einstein equation and together with the tangent vectors. <coughs> and this symmetric form omega is um, a two form in the infinite dimensional phase space of GR. Um, we can then use that symmetric form to define the charge. Um, if one of the variations, say H prime, is pure gauge, which means that um, it's generated by some vector field zeta in this way, then um, this gives rise to the IO wall charge, so the, the um, symplectic form becomes the IO wall charge. And um, as I said before, um, omega is divergence free, which means we can write this charge as a um, surface integral, f, so df is omega, where s is um, some closed two surface zeta. So we can physically think of um, this I will charge, delta Q, as a change in the charge conjugate to the vector field zeta um, between the space-time G and the space-time G plus H. So for example, physically, if you think about it, if zeta is a um, time translation, then um, this delta Q just becomes the quasi-local mass enclosed by S. But S might also be um, some surface or some, um, some surface in space-time some boundary of space time. So, for example, if S is a section of infinity and um, zeta is a killing vector, then Q this just becomes the coma formula. Um, or if S is non infinity and zeta is um, a BMS super translation or super rotation, then we would um, recover the super translation or super rotation charges. Um, that integral F is explicitly given by um, this formula. And in deriving this formula, there are lots of subtleties and um, lots of amb ambiguities which have been written down by Warden Zupas. And this means that um, it's possible that we should add extra terms to this formula. Um, and there are several issues that might arise with this formula which might necessitate the addition of extra terms. So, firstly, this formula is not necessarily going to give rise to integrable charges. Um, and in fact, we've explicitly shown that it doesn't always do that. Um, the second thing we, we have to worry about is we want um, our charges to be exact forms of the phase space. We, um, so we want them to be constant with the phase space so that um, they don't depend on the path taken with going from the metric G to the metric G plus H. <coughs> if we have any of these um, issues, then we might want to make use of the ambiguities in the definition of, of this charge um, to add an extra term like to add a counter term. And so the final resulting charge, um, any vector field zeta, is going to be the sum of the eye wall charge and the counter term charge. Um, so different morphisms um, should form an algebra, and so too should their charges, Q. 
but um, we can explicitly find that the charges and might give rise to an extra term k, which is a central term. If, if k is zero, then this is just an expression of normal coordinate invariance. But um, if k is not equal to zero, then coordinate invariance is violated, and that's um, physically unacceptable. Um, it's like an anomaly in many theories, and we need something then to cancel this anomaly. Um, so this k is a central term, and it's given by um, this delta q um, of where it's generated by two vector field theta, or one vector field. Um, and the general form is going to be some constant c over 12 times n cubed delta n plus n of terms that we can um, set to zero, which is by shifting the charges. So, sorry, what's the zeta n here? Well, um, what are the killing vectors? For sure? So these are just um, any vector field. And for most vector fields, you actually get a zero central term. But there'll be some vector field in which that's non zero. Think about um, observers external to a curved black hole. So um, for these observers, the boundary of their space time is going to be the event horizon of the black hole um, at R plus. And we know the Kerr metric very well in Euler's coordinates, but let's define a new set of conformal coordinates um, in terms of W plus, W minus, and Y. Um, and here, um, R plus and R minus are just the inner and outer horizons of Kerr. And these quantities T, R, and TL, T right and T left, are just given um, in terms of the inner and outer horizons and A, the rotation parameter. Um, and it's interesting to note that under 2 pi rotations of phi, these um, coordinates have um, these periods. So we're going to look at, we're, we're, this by draw curve, this is scry plus, this is scry minus, h plus, and h minus. Here, w minus equals zero in our coordinates, and here, w plus equals zero. And we want to look at the bifurcation surface, um, where w plus and w minus equals zero. And you can... Um, write the Kerr metric as an expansion about that point, um, and the leading order metric is then given by this um, formula. And for, if you sort of ignore the, for, ignore the theta dependence, this looks um, a lot like ADS, it looks a lot like ADS, but the periodicity is something that actually is not quite ADS. Um, so we can find, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I have a quick question. So this central term, mm -hmm. so what, why do you want to cancel it? Um, if that central term exists, then that suggests that there's a violation of just normal coordinate variance. <coughs> oh, I see. It's so like you think this is a gauge, uh, so a gauge anomaly. Yeah. Okay. Not, not in the global symmetry. Um, okay. Yeah, it's like a coordinate. Sure. Um, so... We can find vector fields that represent super rotations on the horizon, and these are just going to be like coordinate transformations um, on the bifurcation surface. And the way we come up with these vector fields is by looking at similar calculations um, in ADS3. Um, so I'm going to con consider one set of vector fields, um, zeta right, um, which are generated by a function epsilon of w plus. Um, and we want these vector fields to be invariant under 2 pi rotations. <coughs> so um, we can do that by choosing our epsilon to be um, 2 pi t right, w plus the 1 plus i n over 2 pi t right, where t right was defined, the same t right was defined before. Um, and these vector fields then obey a centerless Virasoro algebra. And the zero mode of the vector field um, is <coughs> the liquid coordinates d by d by d by plus 2 m squared over a d by dt. And I'm going to call that omega right, like the, a right energy. If you, if you take this vector field and set w plus w minus everywhere, and t right to t left, then you get a second um, set of vector fields, zeta left, um, which is now generated by function w minus. And these also obey a centerless Virasoro algebra. 
um, and also can meet with the first set of vector fields. Um, the zero mode here is um, 2m squared over a d by dt, and I'm going to call that the um, omega left, like a, the left energy. Um, you can look at the vector fields and see that the um, these are right preserves the future horizon, <coughs> and these left preserves the past horizon. We can use each one of these vector fields to compute a charge, and we're going to evaluate those charges um, on the bifurcation surface. And um, we'll start just by evaluating the um, I wall charge, that first term. And if we do that for theta right, um, you get this. You get this function um, 2j t right <coughs> omega t right um, m cubed delta m plus m. And similarly for, t, um, for zeta left, you get a similar you say you do not have central term? You do. This is the central term. Uh, you're using this C is from uh, uh, the, the super rotation? C? Uh, okay. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're taking... Um, this vector is a super rotation? Yeah. Okay. And you, and you compute the charge, oh. delta Q, when you when your input is this vector field and you look to see if there's going to be a central term in the algebra of those charges. And you find that there is a central term and it looks like this. So it's basically just from computing commutators of vector field? Okay. It's from computing um, <coughs> this expression, K is delta Q, where you take your zeta to be that superrotation vector field. Oh, but last slide you said this does not have a central term. Um, the vector fields themselves don't have a, the algebra of the vector fields don't have a central term, so it's like the first line. Oh. And then, but when you calculate the algebra of the charges, there might be oh. a central term there. So the charges are just <coughs> integrations of the vector field? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, so you're saying the integration don't commute with the commuter, commuter? Is that the statement? Integrations. I mean, if you if you integrate the, you you're saying the vector fields don't have a central term. The vector fields themselves don't have a central right. term. Right. Now, if I integrate the vector fields, I should get a charge. Um. Yeah. Well, it's it's not. It's, it's not just the it's the integral is it's like this. Oh. Yeah. Where now um, h is also generated by the vector field. They're both pure gauge. So it's like a complicated integral that you have to do, and you find that that gives rise to something non-zero. So what is it? That, what, what is this f again? So f, this is um, your charge like intergram. So you so you you start with your um, action, and then you can derive your symplectic form from the action, mm -hmm. and your symplectic form is this thing omega. Right, the symplectic form is on the face space. <coughs> right? Yeah. So this charge is it acts on the face. Space space. It's yeah. not on. It doesn't act on physical space. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you find that you do get central terms, and they're of this form, and this is um, quite alarming because um, they are temperature dependent central terms, and which means they're not constant on phase space. The other alarming thing is that um, we expect these central terms to obey the Lodzikoff's theorem, which says that the central terms um, sh should not be dependent on um, a continuously varying, um, continuous variable. And these temperatures are um, dependent on the mass of that pole, which is a continuous variable. Um, so this means that um, we need to add something to that f, that expression, in order to find some counterterms or something, um, so that the resulting charges um, are, are constant on phase space. Um, so we know we have to add some some counterterm. Um, the walls we pass counterterm um, is of this form, where um, x is a space-time one form constructed from the geometry. Um, but x isn't fully specified, and it's left as an ambiguity. Um, and 
I've been to loads of different papers where people have suggested lots of different um, candidates for this council term. And it's just basically so far being made on a case by case basis. <coughs> but ultimately, um, the charter should generate a symmetry via the Dirac bracket, and that will really clinch the argument for what this precise form should be. But whatever it is, it has to be linear in H? Uh, H is G is uh, G zero plus H. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is our candidate, which um, basically is um, <coughs> it's something that depends on this thing called the Hatchet One form, which is a measure of the rotational velocity of the horizon. Um, Q is the induced metric on the bifurcation surface, and it depends on two um, vectors, N and L which are null vectors and normal to the bifurcation surface. And this is our proposed um, candidate for our counter term. In the non-rotating case, the whole construction works without adding the counter term? In the non-rotating case, short um, Schwarzschild is like actually very complicated um, because it's a bit degenerate because as you take rotation A to zero, your temperatures diverge. So it's a sort of a whole different game. I'm trying to say that two left and two right, they should be done in parallel so they're equal and then it goes to a half. Yeah. You have the compression like ratios for the temperature or left right asymmetric and you have an answer that the temperature and bending in the sense right away. You mean in the previous slide? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we might hope that we want C left equals C right and then yeah. you can find the expression. Yeah, exactly. Um, and because of a sum, it gives you nothing. Um, but we, we take this as our candidate counter term, and if you do that and you then calculate the charge coming from this counter term, you get um, these expressions. And this means you can then um, find your overall central term by summing your original piece, your IO wall piece, and your counter term piece. And if you do that, you find your um, both sets of vector fields. Your central term is just J and cubed. Um, so this means that in the algebra of charges, you have a central term and you have an anomaly which you need to cancel. And this um, would give rise to the, the central charges, C left equals C right is 12J. So this really means that observers exterior to the black hole um, would see a violation of coordinate variance unless there's something to cancel it. Um, so I'm going to take a different tangent and consider black hole scattering. Um, so the absorption probability for particles of energy of energy and angular momentum m is um, proportional to this formula, <coughs> where um, omega left and omega right um, are given here. And if you think about omega as d by dt and m as d by d5, then these correspond to the zero modes of the two sets of vector fields that we used before. And here t left and t right are just the same temperatures as we defined before. But this um, formula is actually very familiar from a totally different context. It's also the probability for absorption in a 2D conformal field theory um, for excitations of energy omega left and omega right and temperature t left and t right. So the first um, expression was just a statement about scattering in Kerr, and actually this um, is about a thermal conformal field theory, so it's totally different. That means we can hypothesize that the black hole itself is a um, 2D conformal field theory. This means that on a section of the horizon, an observer outside the black hole would see a CFT with temperatures T left, T right, and charges C left, C right, which would cancel the anomaly. In terms of conformal field theory, we can then calculate the entropy of the black hole um, using a Cardi formula. And this is Cardi's formula, pi squared over 3, c left, t left, plus c right, t right. And now we've just calculated c left and c right are 12j. And we input t left and t right, um, given that we know what they are. We find that the entropy um, is the entropy of the curved black hole, and it is the area over 4. So this um, really suggests that the um, soft hair can account for the entropy of a black hole. Um, the entropy can be reproduced.
produced by microchips living on the horizon. And it's like, it really is a holographic picture. And so I was saying to Shah, the, um, the Bible mm -hmm. does hold your short shield, but you have to take um, a limited procedure once you've done it. It's one of those things where um, trying to do the simplest thing works out to be the most complicated thing because the temperatures diverge and the charges seem to go to zero. So it, the whole setup works if you do it with curve first and then um, go backwards. Um, we don't know that our counter term is unique um, or universal. It seems to work for the kind of human, um, but we don't know that necessarily it's yeah, it's unique. Sorry, uh, basically, what is uh, what do you mean when you say that there is a safety as a horizon? So there's a um, conformal the field theory um, on the horizon, which has left and right temperatures and central charges. So this is a 4D black hole. This is a 4D black hole. So the horizon is a 3D space, while the uh, 2D black hole is empty. Or I'm thinking of the horizon as an S, like, uh, as an S2. Right, but there's also kind of... Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, the bifurcation surface becomes, like, the mirror here has a solid, but, like, yeah. like the celestial sphere and the lower surface here. Okay. So, uh, when you say that there is a P, experimentally, what do you mean? Kind of a measurement and see there is a P rather than vacuum and the horizon. Physically, what does it mean to have a safety at the horizon versus vacuum at the horizon? Um, These questions have the same answer that they have in string theory. Okay, There's no theory. difference. I mean, what was string theory? Uh, yeah, I don't know what the answer is in string theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer in string theory is that uh, you know we have two dual descriptions and uh, they're completely equivalent. Oh, you're saying it's a uh, like boundary description. It's a boundary description. Yeah. The one thing is, so wait, your point of view is that you're canceling the anomalies with the extra safety rather than matching anomalies. I guess, like, is that like? I don't. I'm just saying, like, um, maybe like my naive picture of you thinking that like I calculate something in the GR side and then I say that there's this effective. 2D CFT that we can think of as like corresponding to the horizon, but that isn't actually at the horizon, like in like in addition to whatever to cancel the anomaly, like the central set. Um, I said the word is a little different than maybe what I would have thought it was. And do you have any Oh, I would get a better mm. Like, I mean, like an ADS CFT where I have this dual CFT that is the same yeah, I mean, partition function versus actually being on the boundary in addition to whatever is middle. Oh, I see what you mean. Like, is it actually there? Or like, I don't think it's just a dual description. I think it's a description. Like, it's what, um, it's what you'd see to cancel the anomaly of mm -hmm. coordinate variance. That's it. Um, well, so I just, I'm just going to say there was lots of um, questions that we still don't really know the answer to. Like, we don't know what exactly is this conformal field theory. Um, we also... In, if we wanted to have any hope of solving the information paradox, we'd have to um, find out if the entropy accounts for all the information in the black hole. And this just isn't clear. We also don't know how the information collapse gets encoded into the field theory. And there's also the species problem, which we don't have to deal with. So um, this is not a solution to the information paradox, but um, it's hopefully. So just to follow the logic, so you're saying you have some anomalous central charge at first, but then you, you want to cancel it, so you add some counter terms, mm -hmm. but then you, you have this computation with Cardi formula at the end, so what yeah. uh, central charge do you use in the Cardi formula? So, so the, um, Is that original? Is the central or? charge um, C. That's the original anomalous central charge. No, so, so um, mm -hmm. this kind of terms make it J instead of T dependent. Yeah so, yeah, so this is this is the K coming from the, the first bit. Yeah. Like the central term. Yeah. And then you add your um, extra counter term. Okay. And you turn out to have K 
is j times m cubed. That's your that's this is your central term. Okay, so it's, it's still not cancelled even after you add. The and then you, you get the central charges by um, central charges are defined by c over twelve times. This. So you can work out then what your c left and c right are, and it's these are the inputs for the Carly formula. So uh, I just thought that originally you wanted to cancel central <laughs> charges completely because you thought of them as an anomaly. Yeah. Right? So uh, in this formula, then I would have thought that. Uh, uh, this last term should be should be set to zero because it's, uh, you think of well, them as gauge. That, that, that's the, um, so, so maybe you just add one more CFT yeah, to seconds. cancel that, then that CFT give you that counting. I, I just confused yeah, that, uh, that there are two statements which seem to be <laughs> contradictory. So one of them is that you want to cancel central charge because you can you, you want to you cancel, want to cancel the, anomaly. the anomaly. Yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, you use Cardi formula. Maybe so, so you want to C left minus C right. Mm -hmm. oh, you're, you're saying that you're adding a CFT to have the opposite central charge or have the same central charge as the slightly Yeah. So the cancelling is equal. Well, After cancellation, they have equality of the left and right. Which is discrete, right? You want to get something that is discrete, right? So yeah. the question I think is that whether after adding this, uh, you know, contact and you're gonna to live to be left with some discrete value, or you're gonna to disappear this completely? Yeah. So once you've added the count term, you get um, k is just j m cubed. J is always positive. Is that sign right? It's the absolute value. Um, that's that's no, that's the that's the but yeah if c left is equals to right then you just have okay you have the same anomaly in the left and right but in what sense it's but but i thought you want to think of them as gauge transformations and so in that case you would want like in string theory for, for example you would set c to zero, and that's how you get, you know, 26 or whatever, 10 dimensions. And but then the total central central charge is just zero. But not for string theory black holes. This is exactly like what we do in string theory black holes. Uh, so there you they're, take central charge of the like matter sector, and you would include cluster. Well, the the central charge of the conformal field theory that's dual to the black holes, not of the string world sheet. Questions. It's okay. I think your logic uh, in the beginning said that you should make a central charge with zero, central charge with zero, such that the coordinate transformation is uh, not violated. It's not, it's not that you want the central term to be zero, but if you have a non-zero central term, then you need something to cancel it. Mm, that, yeah. That sounds like is the final zero. goal to cancel it to be zero? Um, you or you just want to cancel until it is like 12J? Okay, so, so I think it's two different things. The, if you have a central term at all um, in your algebra of your charges, then you're going to need to find something to cancel that central term. Okay. Okay. Then the question is, what is that central term that you're going to need to cancel? Mm -hmm. Okay. That central term that you need to cancel is 12j, and you reach that by taking your original formula and adding a counter term. So that's all about calculating your central term. It's not about cancelling it. And then once you discover you have a central term that's non-zero, then you need you know you need something. Anomaly. And it's the you find it, it's a conformal field theory, and that's that's what you use to But but you may end your system as a whole have no central term because it's cancelled. Um, the there's no central term, the central term is zero. Like you said. So the question is we can cancel the formal anomaly in in uh, string theory because we actually want the world sheet to be conformally invariant. Yeah, because there's So why can't we just say that this like whatever we find is a central charge and that there's some um, like quantum representation where this is a ray representation we don't expect it to have a zero, like the realization doesn't have to be the same algebra as the classical guy. I mean, maybe it's just like, like I don't see what the problem with having an zero central charge is oh. like, right now in, the, in a quantum theory. Because it's gauge symmetry? No, but it's somehow the realization of it on like this Hilbert space where there's a phase factor for, like for your state, mm -hmm. like can have representations where the operators don't well, it's either like, gauge symmetry and it should be zero, or it's not a gauge symmetry. And then it should be maybe it's not a gauge symmetry. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, okay. Maybe it's a I guess we. <laughs> Is there <laughs> any other question about it? Uh, 
What is the interpretation of the entropy that you see? Um, what is the second interpretation? The, 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 Great pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Professor Daniel Kennefek. Uh, Professor Kennefek is a astrophysicist and a historian of science uh, at the University of Arkansas. He completed a PhD uh, from Caltech, where he essentially did two theses in one, if I understand this correctly, a physics PhD as well as a history PhD. He then went on to be a research associate at Cardiff uh, and then also a research fellow at Caltech was an editor at the Einstein uh, Papers Project before joining the faculty uh, at Arkansas. He's worked on a range of issues in history and in physics, including gravitational waves, uh, the spiral structure of this galaxy, the history of the century of relativity, and astronomy as a recent book, which you might be interested in, uh, titled Traveling at the Speed of Thought, Einstein and the Quest of Gravitational Waves. And today, he's going to tell us about uh, a brief history of gravitational wave motion. Thank you, Faraz, and thank you for inviting us. Uh, very interesting for me to be here. It's uh, such an interesting, multidisciplinary group. And uh, I felt if I was going to try to say something of interest to people who are interested in black holes, that uh, I would talk a bit about LIGO's detection uh, in terms of my interest in the history of gravitational wave theory. But in order to tie it more clearly into the topic of black holes, uh, I would talk a little bit about something that I don't yet know a whole lot, but hope to learn more, and that is numerical relativity and how uh, simulations of, of binary black hole in spiral and merger was uh, a pretty critical role in interpreting the uh, recent detections of gravitational waves in binary black hole systems. So uh, that means that I've set myself up with a lot to talk about, so uh, I'm going to skip things over in a fairly cavalier fashion, but please feel free to jump in with questions if you would like to hear more. So I'm going to take it that people are familiar with the LIGO detectors, uh, uh, which made the uh, successful uh, detection of gravitational waves uh, for the first time. Uh, so I've just given you a, 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 a few pictures here, and uh, I'll remind you that uh, the first signal that was seen uh, was GW150914, so it was detected on the 14th of September 2015. And uh, what was detected was uh, the merger of two black holes in a binary system, and this is uh, still from a simulation of uh, the system. So there's where the two black holes are, and there's an Einstein ring around the system. And again, I'm, I'm going to assume that everybody has a, has a basic idea of what is said to have transpired. Uh, as I mentioned, my, uh, one of my interests is the history of gravitational waves, and that now has a dual sense, obviously. One is uh, the history of how we came to understand gravitational waves, and the other is the history 
of gravitational waves in the universe that we've been piecing together. So 1.3 billion years ago, that binary black hole system merged, and the gravitational waves set out on their journey to Earth to eventually be detected. Uh, here, in fact, is uh, the, uh, the signal uh, in the LIGO Hanford data. Uh, sending out three solar masses of gravitational radiation towards us. Uh, another interesting data point, critical data point in the history, uh, of course, we had previous experimental evidence that gravitational waves existed in the form of uh, observations of the binary neutron star system in our galaxy. Uh, it's something like 21,000 light years away, so the light uh, that was detected from that system in 1974 uh, uh, set out on its journey uh, quite some time ago, but only a blink of an eye, though, compared to when the gravitational waves set out from the binary black hole system in a distant galaxy. And then, of course, even more excitingly, but I won't talk about it in this talk, uh, can, maybe not even more exciting, but with also very exciting, um, <laughs> a uh, binary neutron star system, and again, a different galaxy, and not our own galaxy, but again, not nearly as far away as the binary black hole system was detected uh, last year. Uh, of course, there have been several other detections, but uh, those, I suppose, are the highlights. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to quickly, uh, having said so much, uh, jump over into the history of how we piece this together. And we only have to go back a century for that, because that's about as long as gravitational waves have been in our minds. Um, and it is only a little over a century ago that we first find Einstein using the term. Uh, Others did before, but uh, Einstein is the first person to give us anything like a concrete theory. So it's very interesting in that context that the first time that he uh, talks about it, he says uh, that they don't exist. Right? So here he is writing to Schwarzschild in early 1916. Since then, I have handled Newton's case differently, of course, according to the final theory. Thus, there are no gravitational waves analogous to light waves. This probably is also related to the one-sidedness of the sine of scalar t, incidentally, the non-existence of the guide point. So, uh, this subject began with skepticism. Uh, Einstein says, uh, well, I've thought about it a little bit, and I don't think that they exist in my theory. And he changed his mind in the same year. He decided to go on from a Newtonian approximation of his theory to a linearized approximation, and quickly realized that it was quite easy in the linearized approximation to come up with a wave equation, especially with the right choice of coordinate systems. And he produced a paper uh, discussing gravitational waves in 1916, and then uh, after correcting some errors in that paper, another one in 1918, which is really the foundation of the field. Um, but in the, again, in the interest of moving along, I'm going to take you then uh, to when he flip-flopped again in the 1930s, when he decided, well, okay, what I did before was really just an approximation. Could I find an exact <coughs> solution uh, in general relativity describing uh, gravitational waves? And this is a letter uh, from Einstein to Max Born. That's Born there on the left. Um, he says, next term we are going to have your temporary collaborator Infeld, so they called Infeld there with Born, here in Princeton. Uh, together with the young collaborator, I arrived at the interesting result that gravitational waves do not exist, again, uh, though they had been assumed a certainty for the first approximation. Uh, this shows that the nonlinear general relativistic field equations can tell us more, or rather limit us more, than we had believed up to now. And, and for a brief period, I seem to have entertained the hope that somehow or another GR was going to give him some very fundamental insights into uh, into quantum theory because somehow or another it would turn out that certain solutions which you thought you would have wouldn't really turn out to be true. And uh, he very quickly, uh, fairly quickly, uh, realized that he was wrong. But in the meantime, he had sent the paper, uh, which he had worked on with Nathan Rosen, that's the young collaborator, uh, to the physical review. Uh, some of you will probably already know this story, but I thought back uh, for those who didn't. It, uh, emphasizes the controversial nature of this field. Uh, the paper that they sent off had the title, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? And it had, that had a very simple answer, no. And uh, he, uh, he had sent in a couple of previous papers. They're very well known. Uh, the Einstein Rosen Bridge and the EPR paper. Uh, and this time he got quite a different response. Uh, this, in fact, is a response. I'm taking the liberty of returning to you the paper by yourself and Dr. Rosen. Uh, before publishing your paper, I'd be glad to have your reaction to the various comments and criticisms the referee has made. So uh, previously, he had not received such a thing as a referee's report. <laughs> he now got a 10-page referee's report. And here's what he had to say in reply. That's his uh, the German version. He then uh, translate, had, uh, uh, 
probably had it translated to send. Here's the, the translation of that. Dear Sir, we, Mr. Rosen and I, have sent you our manuscript for publication <laughs> and have not authorized you to show it to specialists before it is printed. I see no reason to address the, in any case, erroneous comments of your anonymous <laughs> On the basis of this incident, I prefer to publish the paper elsewhere. Can you respond directly? Yes, that's right. Yes, I can tell you that the physical review always likes it when I give this talk because it has a good moral, right? You should listen to your referee. However, I can tell you that I, uh, I have given this talk in front of a room full of fairly distinguished people, and at, at, when I read out this letter, a then future Nobel laureate turned to everyone else in the room and said, wouldn't you love to write a letter like that? <laughs> <laughs> is it known who was the referee? Yes, it is known who was the referee, so, so let me tell you. Um, Wait, sorry, at, uh, at the time, did the referee know who, who the author was? Uh, yes, at that time, the referee knew who the author was. Okay. That's right. In fact, here we have... Um, Slightly. <laughs> um, this is the referee, Howard Percy Robertson, famous man, uh, Friedman Robertson Walker Metry. Uh, here he is writing to the editor the, the next year and sort of filling him in on what had happened. He says, You neglected to keep me informed on the paper submitted last summer by your most distinguished contributor. <laughs> But I shall nevertheless let you in on the subsequent history. It was sent without even the correction of one or two numerical slips pointed out by your referee to another journal. And when it came back in Galley Proust was completely revised because I had been able to convince him in the meantime that it proved the opposite of what he thought. So it turns out that uh, Robertson, of course, and uh, Einstein were both at Princeton, and uh, Robertson struck up a relationship with Infeld, who I just mentioned. And uh, one day Infeld, uh, happened to mention to Robertson, Einstein thinks gravitational waves doesn't exist, he's convinced me it's all true, and Robertson said, oh yes, I don't think so, uh, tell me all about it, and <laughs> Robertson, uh, in his autobiography, says that he then proceeded to work on the board describing the proof, and he rather innocently says in the autobiography, I marveled at the quickness with which Robertson took in what I was saying, because Robertson, <laughs> <laughs> Robertson obviously never bothered to let anybody know that he was the referee. Uh, but through Infeld, he managed to convince Einstein that he had made a mistake. But I'm curious, yes. so before 1936, yes. Einstein never had a paper referee? That's an excellent question, and I cannot tell you for sure that it never happened, but it would never have happened that he had, I'm pretty sure, not turned down, uh, yes, that's right. but I'm pretty certain also he never had an anonymous referee, of course, oh, okay. uh, it wasn't, you know, there were certain things that were a little bit like refereeing, uh, although I don't know to what extent Einstein had these, I mean, obviously, if you wanted to publish in a proceedings of an academy, then you had to send the paper to somebody who was a member of the academy, and uh, Einstein himself. But in his early days, in the yeah. Nollinger Physique, 1905, yeah. Wilhelm Wien refereed yeah. the paper, I mean, yeah. He, yeah. You know, he was an unknown patent clerk, and yeah, yeah. people. Yeah. But I think the point is that you're saying by by the 30s, yeah. he, he's Einstein. He had reached he's the level that clerk. he should not be. Yeah. <laughs> he thought so. He thought so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that was a, that was a factor. I mean, you will get people contemporaneously in the 30s saying, you know, the tradition in continental Europe was that that if you were of sufficient stature, it would be sort of expected that you would be published. Uh, one comment that you read from people writing at the time is, in, in Europe, the tradition is better uh, better a wrong paper than no paper. And in American Britain, the, the philosophy was better no paper than a wrong paper. Um, Lanchos, writing to a colleague uh, at, at this time, refers to the rigorous criticism common for American journals. So there were a whole number of ways, I think, in which this was something that was uh, just unexpected for Einstein. But obviously, a major part of it was these... Yeah, he felt it was a bit of a cheat. Yeah, so, you know. um, With Astro PH nowadays, he would have gotten through. Um, one thing that's interesting is the first two papers, even at Physical Review, it was clearly, uh, let me show you. Yes, so here's the law book at Physical Review uh, of that period, and here's the paper, Einstein and Rosen, the date in, and here's the referee, Robertson. So we know. Uh, we have it at, but you can see that some papers weren't refereed. And in fact, Einstein's two previous submissions to Physical Review, that was true. So one of the interesting things about John Tate, uh, father of a famous mathematician who was then the editor, is his instincts were pretty shrewd, right? Because he gets the EPR and the einstein rosen Bridge paper, decides let's, and then he gets this paper and he goes, you know, I think I'll have Robertson read this one. Uh, so an interesting aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Things quite accurately. Uh, let me then very briefly sketch in some of the subsequent history. Okay, now Einstein, as far as we know, never really uh, dealt with the project of the, the 
problem of gravitational waves again after this. But it so happens that his two assistants of that period, uh, who were most intimately involved with this particular topic, Rosen and Infeld, after the war continued to be rather skeptical of the existence of gravitational waves. Rosen, for instance, at a 1955 conference which sort of marked the beginning of the Renaissance of general relativity, actually argued that gravitational waves can't transport energy, they're not real. And this led to a considerable amount of debate in the 50s and early 60s. Uh, one man uh, who did a great deal to uh, answer these criticisms, not just actually from uh, Rosen and Info, but others, uh, was Felix Parani, uh, who, uh, amongst other things, uh, showed how the equation of GD seek deviation could show you how a group of particles actually responds to the wave. And this, of course, focused attention instead of on this uh, non-invariant quantity of the energy in the wave, which you can move around from one part of the wave to the other by suitable choice of coordinates, uh, focused attention on sort of physical, uh, first of all, an, an, an invariant uh, approach, and second of all, on physically what happens to a system as the waves uh, interact with it. And it was Perani's work which lay behind this famous insight from both Feynman and Bondi, uh, which uh, would... Uh, was put forward by Feynman uh, at the 1957 uh, conference at Chapel Hill, uh, this famous sticky bead argument that if uh, a gravitational wave comes by and you have a stick with some beads on it, the beads will be moved by the gravitational wave, so presumably there will be some friction with the stick, so you're drawing energy from the wave, so presumably it has energy uh, that you can draw on. Um, it's worth mentioning that uh, Bondi, um, uh, who had actually helped answer Rosen's skepticism also had his own worries. Uh, and I'll give you a, a quick example of what that might be. Um, the, the basic idea was, okay, for in, in the electromagnetic case, we would say, well, if I have an accelerating charge, it ought to uh, generate electromagnetic waves, so therefore if I have an accelerating mass, it ought to uh, generate gravitational waves. But of course, one of the whole points about general relativity is that it relativizes acceleration. So what do you mean by an accelerating charge? And uh, Ted Newman told me that uh, he can remember being in a room full of relativists, and the question was put to them, I think, by Wheeler. Well, if Galileo had been up in the tower with his two uh, cannonballs or whatever he drops, uh, and he drops one and he holds on to the other one, which one is accelerating? The one that's accelerating in your lab frame or the one that you are exerting a force on <laughs> to stop it from falling? And therefore, which one should generate gravitational waves? And according to Newman, they, uh, Wheeler asked the room to take a vote, and it was split, roughly 50-50. <laughs> they didn't have the quadruple formula? Oh, they had the quadruple formula, oh, right. yes, but there were many people who were very unhappy. They felt that the quadruple formula was essentially an approximation, and they weren't convinced at all. Uh, Bondi, for instance, what, what, the whole motivation behind his uh, news function approach was his, uh, his unhappiness with the idea that it surely in a binary neutron star, the, they are in a binary system, he wasn't thinking neutron stars, uh, the quadruple formula won't, uh, uh, won't operate because you have these freely falling systems that are not accelerating in some g or sense. So he had this, this idea about this. And so the news function, and of course he eventually was the one who convinced everybody that this was fine, but uh, in a way it was because he was so worried about it that he spent so much time. Um, well, did they discuss planets on geodesic orbits, or...? or? Uh, yes, so, so th there was this basic worry that if you were on a geodesic orbit, that, that somehow or another that meant that you weren't accelerating and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't emit gravitational waves. And part of the problem was, of course, you can then attack the problem via the problem of motion, um, but people, when they did this, uh, to begin with, were getting conflicting results. They didn't necessarily agree, and one reason for this actually uh, we already had a, a diagram. Uh, the, uh, a lot of the motivation behind looking at the problem of asymptotic infinity and in Roger Penrose's compactified space tie diagrams was it became apparent that w in general relativity it wasn't entirely clear that if, if the idea was you have to impose the boundary conditions at infinity in order to see what the motion will be in terms with, with radiation reaction, you had to understand what infinity was. <laughs> Uh, and so that uh, certainly was an interesting aspect of the whole story, which I thought I should uh, throw in there. And that led to some other work, which I think I'll skip over in the interest of time. Uh, but the controversy, incidentally, continued on into the 70s, uh, with more and more people being pretty convinced that they were on the right track, but many skeptics, such as Peter Havis and Jürgen Ehlers, being unhappy with the level of rigor that was going into many of the calculations. Um, of course, a major... Uh, uh, 
contribution to the whole thing was the discovery of the binary pulsar and then the discovery that it, the measurement that it was undergoing radiation reaction in a visible way. Um, but this uh, idea of Dyson makes yeah. no sense because it, it, to produce a bit of information, you need to use a solar mass of energy. Yes, yes. yes. I should yeah. mention that uh, Dyson wasn't saying that the extraterrestrials would decide to communicate with gravitational waves. He was saying if I was an extraterrestrial and I wanted to travel between star systems, what I would do is park two neutron stars very close to each other and use the gravitational slingshot effect. And he said if I did this as a byproduct, I would be transmitting gravitational waves through the galaxy. So he, he, I think it was a sort of a mischievous tongue-in-cheek response. You know, sometimes when we'll hear steady people say, well, if I was an alien, I would broadcast on this frequency, so that's where I'm going to listen. And apparently Dyson said, well, if I was an alien. <laughs> <laughs> he is <isn't. laughs> You know what about the Dyson story? <laughs> so, um, okay. Uh, so let me see. I don't want to run too late, uh, but I will at least introduce this topic. Um, the... Uh, so, we've talked a little bit about how uh, skepticism was gradually overcome. Certainly there was no lingering skepticism by the time that LIGO made its discovery. Um, but nevertheless, uh, obviously, to confirm that what you've seen is gravitational waves from binary black hole, you need to have uh, a theoretical prediction that very closely matches. And I already showed uh, the plot to that effect. And uh, that w in the 90s, when I was a student, I can remember that uh, one of the first group meetings I was at, uh, Kip came in, and with a huge sheaf of papers laying out all the work that would need to be done by theorists uh, in order to produce the templates that would be needed to extract the correct information from the, from the uh, gravitational wave signals. Uh, and uh, even at the time, it was impressive, and of course... But it was wrong, because we don't need the templates. Yes, that's right, that's right, yeah, that's true. But, on the other hand, it is useful to be able to produce uh, even ex post facto a template in order to convince yourself of the identity of the system. It's the one system. of these cases where nature was more kind yes. oh, to us than yeah. colleagues. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it happens. Um, okay, so that is, uh, involves uh, numerical relativity, uh, and I'm going to just quickly tell you, I think it's on the next slide. Well, so numerical relativity, of course, already existed uh, in the 90s. Uh, uh, Larry Smarr is one of the pioneers. Uh, a good deal of progress had been made up until the 90s. Uh, yeah, the post here. Yeah. Here. And uh, uh, I was present at the final meeting of the Binary Black Hole Grand Challenge Alliance, which was put together to try to solve just this, just this problem of simulating a binary black hole, simulating the gravitational waves from a binary black hole. And uh, in the second or last, second last or last talk of the meeting, Kip proposed a wager with the numerical relativist. Uh, he bet that LIGO would see the signal from a merging pair of black holes. He predicted it would be binary black holes that would see first. Uh, before they, the numerical relatives, could predict, correctly predict the waveform. And they took the bet, uh, but they did not look very happy about it, I must say. I mean, I, I heard people calling out, well, what are the odds? What odds are you giving us? <laughs> What's the spread? Um, now, some of the younger people have since told me, oh, they were confident enough at the time. But at, at the time, there was certainly some degree of uncertainty uh, whether they were actually going to make it. And, you know, there are lots of reasons why. Uh, you know, examples are the fact that you know, how do you do excision? How do you hide the horrible singularity uh, from the rest of the group? You might think, for instance, that, well, it's okay, I've got an event horizon that's going to protect me. I could sort of cut off the grid somewhere in here. But, of course, there will be some errors. And while the event horizon protects information, prevents information from passing out, that's only information that satisfies Einstein's equations. The error, the numerical errors, by definition, don't satisfy these equations, and they can travel with, as uh, Eddington would have put it in just this context of gravitational wave at the speed of thought. And the speed of thought of a supercomputer is very, very fast indeed, right? So you can have these errors propagate across your grid and crash your computer pretty quickly. Um, famously, a breakthrough was made in 2005 by Franz Pretorius and others. Um, and since then, numerical relativists have made a number of remarkable discoveries and been able to uh, rather impressively match, admittedly after the fact, <laughs> uh, the signal. So that the darker, the, the, the thicker line there is the signal. Uh, as detected by LIGO Hanford, and then the uh, thinner line is the predicted uh, 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 waveform from a numerical simulation. Uh, so what I'm interested in is, well, how was this accomplished from a theoretical point of view? Okay, what we can say is uh, the, uh, 
the fear has had a 50 year head start uh, and has just about managed to get there ahead of the experimentalists. Um, and, and how did they do it? Uh, it? There are, I think, a number of interesting uh, questions, but, oh yes, first of all, I should say, uh, just for fun, um, that uh, uh, astronomers, of course, as you may know, used to be very skeptical of LIGO. <laughs> I live with an astronomer, my wife is an astronomer. I can certainly remember how she used to count up how many kegs you could build. It's interesting she mentioned kegs, but not uh, like healthcare or anything. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the tech with healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I can tell you that in my family, I recently got a promotion as a result of the whole LIGO thing. So uh, one time I was, asked, I was asked to appear on a TV show about the 19, about Einstein and the 1919 eclipse, and my wife was highly amused because underneath my head on screen it said Daniel Kennedy, astronomer. And so then she started introducing me to people who said, he's not really an astronomer, but he does play one on TV. <laughs> and so after the announcement, she said to me, uh, now you're really an astronomer, right? You, you guys are finding, I mean, I had nothing to do with it, incidentally. So, but, you know, grab the, the, the field of gravitational waves has finally arrived. So that's what, an interesting point. There's really a difference within the fields of astronomy and uh, general relativity. So a project that myself and a couple of colleagues, Dennis Lemkul, uh, oh, well, he's ended up being Cardiff. Harry Collins is in Cardiff, and Dennis Lemkul is now in Bonn. Uh, and uh, we're going to look, amongst other things, at how the numerical relativists perform their miracle and uh, how LIGO itself will adapt to being an observatory as opposed to a high precision physics system. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. There is a very interesting point that you should follow on. Yes. And that's the decadal survey in astronomy. Mm -hmm. I guess this is recorded, so I'll be careful. Uh, <laughs> Because, um, well, first of all, LIGO is funded by NSF Physics. And that was justified when it was a physics experiment. But now that they see sources from the sky, you might ask, shouldn't it be in astronomy? No, the astronomers don't want money to be taken out of their project. Now the question is, who will define the future of gravitational wave astronomy? I mean, because it is an astronomical instrument, and it's just like any observatory. And, uh, and so that's an interesting thing to follow because uh, the sociology of the scientists, how they define the future. And of course, there is LISA, that, that's the European mission. Yeah. But uh, there is still the question of how LIGO will, in the next decade, what, what will happen to it. And NSF is debating whether to invest another billion dollars. Uh, so that's something interesting to watch for a historian. Yeah. I did ask one of the recently influential persons in LIGO, well, are you guys? at all interested in switching over from physics to astronomy. And he said no also on the grounds that they felt they didn't have any friends, as it were, on the astronomers. I don't mean that they felt people were against them, but that they just didn't, you know, it would be a leap in the dark, obviously. Well, the astronomers are worried about funding. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, yeah. But, uh, and also the other comment, the uh, NSF funded uh, a ch grand challenge back in the yeah. 90s. Yeah. Uh, like, and that was, yeah, to do the numerical simulations. It was a 10-year program yeah. of people trying to use the best computers to, to make advances. And there were big teams funded heavily. But eventually the advance came from a postdoc somewhere that uh, was smarter than anyone else. Uh, and so that's an important lesson that putting a lot of money into something doesn't lead to results. You just need the right person to think about the right idea. It's a yes, little different if it's hardware though, right? Hardware? Like how yeah, is it hardware, yeah. but this was a challenge for a theoretical, right. for yeah, numerical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, the lesson is that you can't make advances just by putting money. I mean, you have to create a culture, intellectual <coughs> culture, that, that but, allows people to think independently. But, and but, because, Abby, Abby, if that but money I, wasn't there, would that postdoc necessarily have gotten funding? Oh, sure, he would have gotten a postdoc position. I don't think he would have suffered. I don't know, things are nonlinear. <laughs> well, but you it's, uh, okay, so it's the tale of... Like, you're talking about 100 k out of a $10 million grant that was given to France Pretorius, okay? But what I'm saying is that if, if you establish a culture where uh, people think independently, that is worth much more than putting $10 million into a group of old people that think the same way. I mean, that's, that's my point. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very interesting point, and we definitely are hoping to look into that, because as you say, 
uh, you can also point out that the, the NSF was definitely betting on the idea that this means a big collaboration exactly. and so on. And then you can say it's a the breakthrough paper was a sole authored paper, so that's and a, a, a junior. Uh, yeah, question. You said uh, in one of your slides that uh, maybe a couple of slides ago that we now have proof that black holes exist. Uh, and and yeah. the question I had is, are we really sure that black holes exist and what constitutes proof? We had a conference here last May and, and there was an open session in which we all took about an hour. And it was led by Ramesh, actually. About, you know, do black holes exist and what's the standard of proof? And right. Different communities have different standards, right? Yeah. There's different yeah. uh, mm -hmm. approaches, whether you're a philosopher, or mm -hmm. mathematician, mm -hmm. physicist, astronomer. Mm -hmm. So in the center of our galaxy, we have Sagittarius A star, and people have seen stars orbiting something. Mm -hmm. Can't really be much other than a black hole. Mm -hmm. Is that proof? And then we see LIGO mm -hmm. with gravitational waves with two merging stellar mass black holes. Hard to think about something that would do that that wouldn't be black holes, and there'd be you know, new evidence coming, you know, about what constitutes uh, evidence for a black hole. But what, in your view, constitutes ironclad evidence for the existence of black holes? Yes. Uh, so certainly, <clears throat> obviously, it could turn out that these two objects were something else, but they would have to be very, very close <laughs> uh, to be black holes. There's, it's certainly, certainly for me, it feels like. Having being old enough to remember when it, that you couldn't get an astronomer to use the term black hole most of the time, and they would talk about dark objects or various sorts of things like that. Uh, there was something about this particular GW 1509-14 that struck me as being okay. This is very convincing <coughs> proof. So yes, for me personally, I would say that was for me the moment of proof. But this question that you raise of standards of evidence is one that we're very interested in because you know. Already, in the relatively you know, half a dozen detections that have been made so far, you have the interesting fact that LIGO has been very concerned to try to provide a very high standard of proof, and they have this sort of five sigma standard uh, and data analysis for announcing uh, a detection. But there, and so that means there's one putative detection which they don't normally include in their list of detections, but which now is being included when they talk to astronomers and astrophysicists about trying to put together a um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a demographic survey, as it were, of, of all the black holes we know. And so this is one detection that they had in which the data analysis suggested the confidence of them wasn't at five sigma. But on the other hand, when you actually look at the waveform and match it, you go, gee, that looks like a, a black hole in spiral. And now, of course, you get to the case that if you are doing uh, a sort of a survey, survey work in astronomy, you don't, you want to be careful, you, you want to pay some attention to completeness. You don't want to be too cavalier about throwing things out because they're dim, because you would like to know something about the, the nature of the population that you have out there. And so uh, right away there you have a clash between the conservatism of a high precision physics experiment which wants to convince everybody that this is what they've seen, and the desire for astronomy to get the maximum advantage out of your observatory from the point of view of making a complete survey. Uh, so that's uh, an issue that we're very keen uh, to get to, but we're only at early days, I'm afraid. So, yeah, I suppose this quadrupole formula, yeah. which came many, many decades ago, right? And then there were all these doubts about it. I, I haven't understood what the problem was, because it seems to be so analogous to what we do in electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. so this is Lama's formula, we just said. Uh, second derivative of the dipole moment tells you what's the energy coming out. And here you've got the third derivative of the quadrupole moment or something mm -hmm. equivalent. Mm -hmm. So it looks so, you know, parallel. Mm -hmm. Why were people questioning the validity of that formula? Uh, I suppose the different doubts were unique to each person. Yeah. But certainly, there were different attitudes to the way one should interpret the analogy of electromagnetism. Obviously, yeah. that was fundamental to the whole project. Mm -hmm. There's a very interesting interchange between Wheeler and Bondi at Chapelville in 1957, in which Bondi is giving a talk, and Bondi keeps saying, people keep talking about the analogy between electromagnetism and gravity, but I don't think that it goes very far. Mm -hmm. Here's an example of something that I think is a, an example, I don't, he doesn't use this term, but what you might call a disanalogy. You know, he says, here's a point at which the analogy breaks down. And he points to the quadrupole. Oh. Uh, yes, I think, well, I think specifically he points to the fact that, um, yes, that you don't have dipole radiation in the gravitational wave okay. case. Yeah, yeah. So there, that's obviously a difference. Yeah. Uh, and then Wheeler immediately jumps in and says, 
no, no, this, this is exactly an example of where the analogy can guide us because, <laughs> and they then go back and forth like several times, no, that's, that's, that's against the analogy, no, that's for the analogy. <laughs> I, think, I think one thing that confused people is the, the energy density in an electromagnetic wave is gauge invariant, mm -hmm. but the energy density in a gravitational wave is not coordinate invariant. But energy is tied in with geometry in this. In but locally. Words. So you could always locally at a point Set, so, set the energy to zero, so yeah. you had to understand coordinate invariance very well, and it. it's extreme, extremely slow subtle, and of course, Bondi did, did really important work on, on understanding it, yeah. But Einstein doubted black holes as well. There's an interesting question about the threshold of satisfaction of a, that you've seen something real and not an artifact, and how many sigma effects it is. And then there's the level of whether of your certainty about what you've seen at all, yeah. you know, that whether whether it's a black hole or something else. Mm -hmm. So there are these two layers, and the, mm -hmm. the template arguments become very obviously important in the latter, even if it's post fact, is to say what the relative masses are and yeah. so on. The other thought, you know, just continuing on the question of its relationship to astronomy, I mean, mm -hmm. kidding around <laughs> aside, I mean, whether it's an observatory or not when it hadn't seen something, but then there's the question of funding and classification of the work and the origins, in a sense, of the people who were working on it and the techniques that come out of it. But then I think this moment a little bit later uh, when you see a neutron star, uh, when Waco sees a neutron star black hole, event and multi-messenger astronomy becomes important, then suddenly the, obser the other observatories and LIGO are in one extended network, in a sense. They're addressing the same phenomenon mm -hmm. or different aspects of the same phenomenon. The same happened with neutrinos. You know? It was not the first time it happened. Neutrino detectors, Camille Kande detected supernovas. It was the same situation. No, no, absolutely. And I think that the, but I, I just mean that in, 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 the, in the trajectory of how LIGO is considered, the moment of multi-messenger astronomy does change its status, regardless of how the funding is taken out of categories. It then is in the world of astronomy in, a, in, a, in, in the sense of, in a strong sense of a collaborative technical understanding of the same object at the same time, at the same place. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt that that was the a major breakthrough in those terms. Uh, but of course, these things do bring with it possible problems that you can see people worrying about. Just to give one example, if you think about an astronomical observatory, the telescope operators, the instrumentalists, are typically not appearing on the science papers as authors. Uh, whereas in the case of LIGO, up to now, the people who build and keep operating the detector are appearing on the papers. But if they lose control of the data, right, the tradition, increasingly the tradition is astronomy is that you've got to release your data fairly quickly. Uh, does that mean that gradually the people who are actually doing the difficult business of getting, keeping the detector up and running and improving the detector then stop being on these exciting papers? When the papers are also 5,000 authors. <laughs> and, 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 like, and that's a new sociological situation in, in astronomy. We never had so many authors, more than the number of words in the paper. So. Uh, and uh, so that's, you know, that has to be dealt because now you have a community of a thousand people in LIGO plus 4,000 astronomers working with them. And how do they communicate and who gets the credit? You know, yeah, it's very uh, controversial. And just to give an example, I saw I asked people about there's a multi-messenger paper with the LIGO and all the astronomers <laughs> on it together. And the question was, how do you decide author order? Because uh, in, in relativity, you tend to go by alphabetically, and, and in astronomy, you don't do that. And uh, as I know myself, uh, so uh, apparently what they decided was, well, er the groups would go in a certain order, and then within your group, you got to decide. <laughs> <laughs> and then the question was, what order do the groups go? <laughs> and, and then Ligo said, well, surely it should be when you when the signal was seen in your detector, because first it takes them a while to figure it out. And the astronomer said, no Nothing way can enough. we do that, because if we do that, they said their tradition is when you send out your circular to tell the world. And they said, if you if you can say later, well, I saw it earlier, then you've got no incentive to tell the world, right? <laughs> we've got to make sure that it's when you send out the circular, when you send out your announcement that you've seen it. <laughs> so uh, let me mention.
and some other things at 3.30 p.m. We'll have a philosophy mini workshop in this room with Professor Kenneth Sikutura Bolton to come to us based on a chapter that he uh, is writing up at the moment. Um, but even if you haven't read the chapter, which we may not have, this should uh, What's the title of this chapter? It's a, it's a, the book is about the 1919 Eclipse Expedition, and the particular chapter is, discusses some of the mid-20th century expeditions to try to confirm what has been seen in that. Oh, it's a little battery. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs>